Ah, oh, welcome back to Behind the Bastards, the only podcast where Sophie was just telling me how much she thinks it would be a good idea to reboot the TV show Friends. But instead of being the cast of Friends, all of the characters are famous medical malpractice committers from history. And it's a show about them trying to get away with maiming their patients. I think it's a bold idea for a TV show, Sophie. I think we should pitch it to Netflix right now. Thank you that's, again. That's, that's totally a, not something I would ever say because Girl, mm-hmm. Girl yeah. Friends was a better show than Friends. Well, um, but, you know. Let's just accept that Sophie said that and move on to Christopher Wong. Christopher, how are you doing in part Hi, two of this episode? Doing, do, do, doing, doing as well as you can be preparing to just talk about Japanese war crimes for an hour. That's good. You know, I I resisted the urge to open this by saying, what's manning my Churias? Because I thought that might be offensive. Oh, Robert, distasteful. (laughs) Yeah. No. Anyway, let's dive back in. This was dark. (laughs) Continue. (laughs) Yay. Yeah. All right. So we're, we're about to start talking about the Japanese forced labor system. And I think the, the best way to introduce this is, by, I'm, I'm going to read part of the introduction to a book called Asian Labor in the Wartime Japanese Empire, Unknown Histories, which is this – basically, there, there's a conference on sort of Japanese war crimes, Japanese sort of forced labor during, during the war, and they, they – all, all the sort of papers in that are like combined into this book. And the, the introduction goes, Grief and despair find little place in most historical accounts and are absent from most of the source material historians use. The hundreds of thousands who died were sons, husbands, and fathers – or sometimes daughters, wives, and mothers, and had families awaiting their return. Deaths often went unrecorded. Coolies too sick to work were placed in death houses where they spent their final hours in accumulated filth, mud and vomit, and the excrement produced by those who had died before them, without food or medicine and certainly without hope. Their corpses were thrown into unmarked graves or burned or abandoned in forests or tossed into rivers. Wee! Welcome to Behind yeah. the Bastards! <laughs> show about bad people! Yeah. <laughs> Now, it's it's really hard to pin down the exact number of people who were forced to work in the Japanese Empire. And this is, you know, this is a running theme of, of this, this episode is that right before Japan was occupied at the end of World War II, they destroyed all of their records. Like, I mean, this and this order, like, this is not just records in Japan. Like, this order goes all the way down the command chain. They're destroying records just everywhere they can find them. So most of what we have are estimates and you know the estimates estimates are not good the the indonesian government estimates that 4.1 million indonesians were forced to work for japan during the war i mean you know it, just just to get a sense of the scale of this like there there's there's an individual railroad called the thai burma railroad just alone that uses 180,000 or possibly as many as 270,000 people yeah and you know cool. the, the 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 yeah the, the the number in in china between 1941 and 1945 seems to have been about 3 million but you know that, that's the only period we have even sort of okay numbers about. Before that, we, we just don't know. And, you know, this is also happening in Korea. 100, 110,000 Koreans are shipped into the army. There's 700,000 who are shipped into forced labor. And Kishi is going to import a lot of those people, like, to Japan to do forced labor. E- e- everywhere the Japanese Empire goes, they're, they're doing this. And, mm-hmm. you know, and we've talked about last episode about how sort of this starts with Kishi talking about, you know, Kishi's like, okay, well, we'll, we'll put the war, we'll put the, war, the prisoners of war to work. And then it expands to just, like, you know, people who are vagrants and people who don't have jobs. And then it's like anyone who opposes us and... By, by by 1941, the Japanese army is doing just slave raids. And yeah, between 1941 and 1942, the Japanese army burns tens of thousands of Chinese villages, and they put the survivors in concentration camps. And they put about they put about a hundred thousand people in, in into these forced labor camps. And of these conscripts, like 30 to 40 percent of them die. Okay, they die from that's distance. not a bad yeah, ratio. I lose yeah, more conscripts. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you know, and I say this like that's th- thirty. The thirty forty percent is kind of being dragged down by the fact that there are some places where the conditions aren't as bad. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you know, and here, like you know, we can talk about a place where it was really bad. Um, so one one of the centers of, of Kishi's five year plan in Manchuria is is these coal mines in Fushan, and you know, the, these these are the coal mines that are like fueling all of Nissan's industrial developments, and the, the replacement rate for these workers between 1938, 1944 was out of every four, the 40,000 workers total they had, they had to replace 25,000 of them every year. And, you know, a small number of these people just like escaped. 
But almost everyone else, and this is, you know, a very small percentage of them escaped, almost everyone else, almost all the 25,000 people either died on the job or Japanese army just executed them for insubordination. Because, you know, this is something the Japanese army starts to do in this period is that they just, you know, they just start randomly killing people. And like these, these people, and we've talked about a bit about the conditions, they die, a lot of these people die from dysentery and they die from cholera because... You know, these camps, like, they, there's there's no medical facilities at all, right? So, you know, when you get sick, they just, like, they lay you on a cot and you die. And, you okay. know, and a lot of these, these people are dying from overwork, they're dying from starvation. And, you know, and then also, like, the Japanese army, like, they're really creative about, like, how they kill people. So, I mean, you have, like, the classic, like, they beat people, they stab people, they shoot, they light them on fire. They they also, like, they throw them off boats. They, like, they drown people in submarines, which is the thing I, I've never found another like recorded thing of people doing is like they'll force a bunch of people into a submarine and just sink it. Oh God! It's, wow, yeah. they really, they, if they're burning a whole submarine, they really want yeah. your ass dead. Yeah, and like like this is a this is a thing like particularly we'll, we'll get more into this in a bit. Like particularly like that that that's a way they kill like comfort women uh. because. Yeah, they don't want any record of them existing. So, oh, we'll 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 t- we'll put them in a submarine and so drop them. So they're putting a bunch like, of people in the these ocean. things. It's it's a way of disappearing. Yeah. Okay, well. Yep, yep. That's that's a bummer. Yeah. So so all all of those numbers that's that's just for, you know, physical labor. Mm-hmm. Um Japan is also running something called the Comfort Women system. And you know, the the Comfort Women system is is the, is the academic and legal term for Japan's military sex slavery system. And so, you know, if you read academic accounts, you read journalistic accounts, you read, like, legal accounts, they talk about comfort women and comfort stations and use all of these, you know, these, like, pretty little euphemisms developed by Japan specifically so that in their, in their, in their, their communications about it, they can sort of obscure what's actually happening here. And this is the point where it becomes useful that I am no longer an academic and I'm not a lawyer, which means I don't have to use any of these. What this is is an a, a enormous bureaucratic organized system of military sexual slavery ran out of army rape rooms. And the, the, the first, the first of yeah, it, it's 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 bad stuff. Like mm-hmm. the, the 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 first of these these sort of military rape stations is set up in Shanghai after Japan launches an attack on Shanghai in 1932 as one of their sort of they have these like periodic sort of fights with 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 the, the Chinese government basically up until 1937 when, like, the actual war starts. And I, I, I want to go into what happened here because, you know, most accounts of sort of Japanese sexual atrocities in East Asia give this, give this like, this whole, the 1932 attack, like, one line. Mm-hmm. And so I, I want to read this passage from the book Chinese Comfort Women, Testimonies from Imperial Japan's Sex Slaves. The soldiers immediately kidnapped good-looking local women and kept them in military barracks as sex slaves. At the same time, the troops continued to assault women in nearby villages. Reportedly, over 1,000 local women were raped in their homes. Not even pregnant women, young girls, or elderly women were spared. Within the same reason, region in the autumn of 1935, more than 100 Japanese soldiers attacked an area where the Chinese resistance force was active. Carrying machine guns, the troops drove the villagers into a large yard, dragged all the women out of the crowd, and raped them in the presence of their family members. Several soldiers ripped the clothes off a woman who was six months pregnant and tied her to a table in the yard. They took photographs while violating her, and then cut her abdomen open and plucked the fetus out with a bayonet. Oof. Yeah, and and this that is before the start of the war. Yeah, we're yeah. not even warring yet. Yeah, nope. Yeah, this is this is this, that's 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 nineteen thirty two or nineteen thirty five. Now the rape stations as a sort of you know, and, and okay, I, I will say one other thing. Hey, there's some indication that the Navy had been using like sort of organized rape stations like before 1932, but this is another one of those things where the documentation is really hard because, you know, I mean, it, the, the army is not just going to tell you they are running a, like a sex slave station. Yeah, most so, people who do sex slave stuff don't like to talk about it all that much. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even like, like even... You know, like they're doing it all the time, but like even even like like slave owners in the South mm-hmm. didn't really like to talk about like the, the fact that that's what they were doing a lot of the time. No, it's yeah, it's, it's like, one of those lead, lead you to one of those are we the baddies kind of moments. Yeah, yeah, it, it's something that even even the people who do it know is wrong. Yeah, yeah. When I talk about the fact that I'm forcing myself on these children that I basically own, I feel like kind of a monster. Yep. <laughs> You know, and it's funny, like, I have actually read accounts of, of Japanese soldiers who dreamed the war were like, wait, are we the baddies? And it never involved this. It was always about, like, like they would be sent into, into the Philippines, 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, and the soldiers are like, they're given the, Ameri- the standard American line of, well, you'll be greeted as liberators. And they get there and, you know, they're like hacking Filipino, like soldiers to death with bayonets. Yeah. And they're like, wait, but it's never this shit. It's, yeah. Now, rape stations don't come into widespread use until after 1937, 1938, which is after the rape in Nanjing. And, you know, that's another atrocity that, like, probably deserves an episode and that because Kishi isn't directly involved in it, we don't really have time to talk about it. The, the short version of it is, so the Japanese army had been expecting to just, like, blow their way through all of China in, like, three days. And instead they fight the Battle of Shanghai, which is, you know, it's, it's, the, the nickname of it is Stalingrad Ground on the Shanghai. They fight this incredibly brutal battle. Like, they lose 60,000 troops. And the army just goes berserk. And, you know, China's capital during the war had been at Nanjing, and Japan takes a city, and they kill... You know, the number of dead civilians and prisoners of war was... It's generally held to be about 200,000, and they also rape somewhere between 20,000 and 80,000 people. Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's it's really bad. Yeah, and like, when like you it, say they raped, and then the number is the population of a small city. Yeah, that's... Yep. that's uh, Again, yeah, you're, it, you're in the A leagues in terms of the crimes against humanity, my friend. Yeah, yeah, and you know, and I say this like, you know, even even with all the stuff we're about to talk about, like these sort of just random rapes, where like the Japanese army goes into a village and rapes everyone, then leaves, like that's still that's still gonna be happening throughout the entire war. And you know, I mean, like, and and to some extent, you can talk about the fact that like sexual violence is always a part of war, but like the Japanese army is like rape heavy by army standards, and mm-hmm. then. They're also doing the sex slavery stuff. And, yeah. you know, yeah. And, and, and something, you know, and I think this is, there's sort of like, there, there, there's a thing that you read a lot about how the military sex slavery system is actually, it, it's, well, it, you know, it's, it's about like the, the Japanese army trying to get the rape under control after, after Nanjing. And like, well, it doesn't work if that's his attention. And the second thing is, you know, it, it's kind of true. But, you know, when I say the Japanese army wanted to get the rape under control, like what I mean is that, they want the rape to happen through the army bureaucracy in army facilities at, you know, created by the army and at times the army is allowed. And they also like want to regulate, try to regulate things in a way that soldiers don't get STDs, you know, but you know, and, and, and they succeed in that to some extent, like they, they succeed in, in bringing the rape directly into the military command chain. Oh, yeah. And you know, b- before so I move on, I, I want to mention th- there's this enormous, primarily Japanese, just like intellectual sort of network and right-wing outrage machine that like, this is their thing. This and denying the rape and Nanjing are like their thing. They're like the Japanese war crimes deniers. Mm-hmm. And they, they, they make all these arguments of how like, no, 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 these weren't, these weren't sex slaves. These were paid prostitutes. Like they're not, you know, or, you know, or that the rape rooms are just sort of brothels and it's not, it was, you know, they're, they're, they're the people who do the whole, it's about stopping rape, not committing it. And it is uh, like very, very important to understand that every single one of these peoples are full of shit. Like, these are these are sort of like in, in intellectually like these, these these people are like like they're 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 incredibly similar to like the 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 sort of like European Western Holocaust deniers like everything they say is lies and the reason they're lying about it and you know the reason they have to do this is because just of of the absolute raw horror of of what I'm about to, of like the stuff that I'm about to read um this is this is a testimony I'm, I'm going to read a testimony taken from the UN Human Rights commission who did a report on on the sex slavery system in 1996 this is Ooh. this is the report of a a korean woman well she's okay, she's not a woman she's a, a child when this happens um and this, you, is, this how, is her recollection uh 13 oh geez okay. child yeah. yeah yeah i mean i was just curious like yeah yeah sorry yeah, yeah, the, yeah. not that it would mitigate anything i was just curious. no yeah yeah well yeah. i mean yeah so sorry the, the reason i didn't say it was so th- this is this is uh the beginning of it is one yeah. day in June, at age 13, I had to prepare my lunch for my parents who were working in the field, so I went to the village well to fetch water. A Japanese garrison soldier surprised me there and took me away so that my parents never knew what happened to their daughter. I was taken to the police station in a truck where I was raped by several policemen. When I shouted, they put socks in my mouth and continued uh. to rape me. The head of the police station hit me in my left eye because I was crying. That day, I lost eyesight in the left eye. After 10 days or so, I was taken to the Japanese army garrison barracks in Haesan City. There were around 400 other Korean, young Korean girls there, and we had to serve over 5,000 Japanese soldiers as sex slaves every day, up to 40 men per day. 
Oh, Each gosh. time I protested, oh, they hit me stuffed rags in my mouth. One held a matchstick to my private parts until I obeyed him. My private parts were oozing with blood. Jesus Christ. One Korean girl who was with us demanded to know why we had to serve so many, up to 40 men per day. To punish her for her questioning, the Japanese company commander Yamamoto ordered her beaten with a sword. While we were watching, they took off her clothes, tied her legs and hands, and rolled her over a board with nails until the nails were covered with blood and pieces of her flesh. Jesus. In the end, they cut off her head. Jesus. Another Japanese, oh. another Yamamoto, told us it was it's easier to kill you all, easier than killing dogs. He also said, since those Korean girls are crying because they have not eaten yet, boil the human flesh and make them eat it. One of the Korean girls caught venereal disease from being raped so often, and as a result, over 50 Japanese soldiers were infected. In order to stop the disease from spreading and to, quote, sterilize the Korean girls, they stuck a hot iron bar in her private parts. Oh Once they took Jesus. 40 of us on a truck far away with, to a pool filled with water and snakes. The soldiers beat several girls, shoved them into the water, heaped earth on the pool, and buried them alive. I think over half the girls who were at the barracks were killed. Twice I tried to run away, but both times we were caught after a few days. They tortured even more. We were tortured even more, and I was hit on my head so many times that all the scars still remain. They tattooed me on the inside of my lip, my chest, my stomach, and my body. I fainted. When I woke up, I was on a mountainside, presumably left for dead. Of the two girls with me, only one had survived. A 50-year-old man who lived in the mountains found us, gave us some clothes and something to eat. He helped us travel back to Korea, where I returned, scarred, buried, and with difficulties in speaking at the age of 18, after five years of serving as a sex slave for the Japanese. Jesus, God. Yeah, it is. There are hundreds Jesus and hundreds God. of pages of testimony like this. Yeah, I mean, you and know, it it's is. my job to read about crimes against humanity, and that's... um. That's one of the roughest like, things I've ever heard. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's, like I, the, the only thing I've ever read, Christ. I don't think I've, that's the, it's the worst account of rape I've ever read. The only thing yeah, I've ever read yeah, that was like, <laughs> yeah, that was like, like even comparable to it was like, it was accounts of like what like Haitian slave owners would do yeah. to like their slaves and that stuff. Yeah. I, yeah. The, those guys I, are like, I think more creative, but I, I heard some accounts oh, from God. Yazidi women who were enslaved by ISIS that, mm -hmm. you know, it was less inventive. It was more with them just a case of neglect, like not letting these women clean themselves and like them just getting these horrible infections as they continued to be. Um, but I don't think I've ever heard a case that's that. Yeah. Because it's not just like, it's not just like violent and horrific. It's like creatively innovatively like a lot of um, yeah like it's it's far more than just you know obviously rape is is very seldom just like about a sexual appetite but it's it's so it's very clearly so much more than just these are soldiers who are horny there's like there's a lot of very frightening yeah. things going on in that yeah i mean i think part of it you know i was talking last episode about the the, the theory of the declining rate of pleasure and you know, I think there's something like this with violence too, where, you know, because the, the other thing that, that reminded me of this in terms of inventiveness that I've read about was accounts of like what this, this, the El Salvadorian National Guard did during like during the Civil War in the 80s. And, and that stuff, it's like, you know, you, you get to a point when you're in a war where like you've seen so much violence that, you know, you become sensitized to it. And it, and it becomes this sort of constant race to like. Yeah find something you can do that's more violent that will like stop people from opposing you but but this isn't even like that these guys just like enjoy this yeah because there's no that's not there's no, none of that that is like an attempt to scare people out of resistance that's just yeah um, it's like serial killer shit you know it's the yeah, it's yeah. The, they, you know you've done so many other depraved things and now you're getting creative with it out of almost boredom um, yep. it sounds like there's an element of that, of just like, well, fuck it. We haven't been stopped yet. Let's try, let's escalate this. Let's, let's, let's go a little further. Let's try something harder. I don't know how much of that is, is boredom, how much of it is like desensitization, but like, yeah, I mean, fuck, it, you could, you, you could have done a whole episode on, on, on that specific, uh, yeah. 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 Like, I think, you know, one of the things that, that the, the, 
like the sources talk about is how this it, it, it's you know it's part it's about power but it's about like power on a sort of civilizational level that it's like you know like what, what what's happening here is that the japanese soldiers are like you know like we we can like like we can rape these women and that's you know this is this is our way of like raping the entire chinese nation it's this way of and part of it is it's about it is kind of about like the sort of demonstration of of sort of violent superiority in that like a a, a lot of what some of the the goals are are about just sort of like like in this weird like like a mass it's supposed to be this like emasculation of like the chinese resistance where it's like like you know if you're a chinese man like he's like hey look what we can do to your women and it's just yeah. this, you know because this this is like this is the way these people think because you know this is like yeah this is it's um okay <laughs> like i i yeah i don't know what else to yeah, say about it i mean I, I think pretty much everyone listening is going to have the same uh reaction which is just kind of like numb horror yeah uh so maybe here's ads yeah Oof. 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 Ads. i i i i i'm not a i'm not an arrogant man when it comes to what we do but i i don't think anyone in the podcasting game can compete with us for the sheer awkwardness of our ad transitions i know it's true. we like the cheese stand alone We're back, uh, and uh, I'm sure all those ads really, uh, really wiped that horror from people's minds. So let's just let's let's barrel straight ahead, and um, uh, um, yeah, let's 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 barrel ahead. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. and th- th- this is another place where it's it's very hard to pin down numbers because the Japanese Empire, you know, like they. They destroy, they destroy every record that they can, and they kill huge numbers of these women to keep them quiet. But the the, the estimated number of women enslaved by the Japanese Empire is about four hundred thousand. Um, the the newer scholarship suggests that about half of them are Chinese. Um, there's also at the very least tens of thousands, and probably almost certainly over hundred over a hundred thousand from Korea. And past that, it gets you know it gets even harder to you know get numbers because the records and the survivors are both hard to find. But yeah, you know, we know that this, this is happening. Like the, the levels of violence and the abductions in the Philippines are similar to this. Um, I, yeah, it's just basically, basically every, everywhere the Japanese empire goes, like this is, this is, this is what they're doing. They're, they're, they're enslaving the people they conquer. Um, you know, we talked about how the victim in that last story is 13. Uh, the, 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 the victims tend to range from about, 11 to 24 and the, the most common is between 13 and 19 because you know these people are also pedophiles yeah 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 I mean, and, and i know, think that I, I think i've told this story a couple of times but there was a moment where i was hanging out in budapest with a friend of mine kind of in, in the center of town they've got all these statues of these these magyar kings on horseback with swords and axes and stuff these like warrior legendary warrior kings and my buddy turns to me and says I wonder how many of them didn't fuck little kids. And that's not a Hungarian yep. thing. That's like literally any any culture. Like when you go back to the 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 conquering war leaders, it's like, yeah, I mean, most of them were fucking 14-year-olds just like half of your favorite rock stars in the 80s. Yep. It's not great. Yeah, and <laughs> it's I, I not think great. this yeah, it's mm-hmm. yeah, this then this I think is this, this is just sort of pure expression of power. And I think it's part of why yeah. and this is folding into a bigger thing. We don't have to go out, but like why I think it's so toxic that like our cultural discussions of pedophiles always focus on what's much rarer, which is like adults like going after and molesting like little bitty kids, four and five year olds. When like mm-hmm. the vast majority of pedophilia is a uh, is grown men who the most people would not say are a pedophile who go out of the way to fuck teenage girls. That's most of yep. it. That was Epstein. Yeah, you know. Um, yeah. Anyway, sorry, rant over. No, yeah, I, mean, I think. Like this, this, this is just sort of like what having absolute physical, like the, the ability to just murder anyone you want. Like this is what that does to you. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one of the other things that's very common here is that a lot of the, the, the women and children, and again, I want to emphasize like these are children mm-hmm. who resisted, you know, like these are, these are fucking 14 to 19 year olds. And, you know, they're either beaten, stabbed or just decapitated. 
and you know they, they so decapitate horrible. kids in front of their families like constantly Oof. there's also um so almost everyone involved in this all the women all the children become addicted to opium or some some other yeah, drug I mean, that's because, yeah. who who, who yeah, would not yeah. <laughs> yep yep um and you know there's also you know we've sort of we sort of alluded to this but like there, there's Everyone gets venereal diseases. Yeah. Because yeah, it turns also, out that when that you're getting raped stands. by 40 men a day, yeah. you get venereal diseases. And yeah. the army the army injects like the sick with what almost certainly was the mercury-based antibiotic uh Salversan. Yeah, it doesn't seem is, like mercury would yeah, help. No, it's it's yeah, it's you know, and and they're doing this not because they care like at all that these women are like disease, like, mm-hmm. you know, they're getting, getting sick. Like they're doing this because they want to keep down the spread of disease among the soldiers. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this is, this is where you start to get to just, I mean, the, the, the horror of this just like doesn't end because, you know, and these people have to deal with addiction. They have to deal with disease. And again, the people who survive this. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, they, they have, they have this, like this unspeakable, tr- like literally like people lose the ability to talk. Yeah, it's this incomprehensible. Uh, yeah, in a lot of ways. And then you know, to make it worse, uh, the communities are taken from, like, a lot of the time they don't want them back, because yep. you know, yeah. like these women are seen to have been defiled by the Japanese, and so you it's know, another thing look, that's one happened this, a bunch of times. I mean, there's there's versions. Yeah, of yeah. Recently with ISIS, yeah, it had yeah. a lot of times throughout history. Yeah. Yep. Like I like I read a story about I, someone whose accounts I almost included in here and then cut because it was too long but like she, so she, she comes back to her village and like the the only person in her entire village who will like talk to her is the person she was supposed to be married to and like that guy is like a genuinely good guy but like he can't take it and he goes and joins the army and then like dies somewhere fighting the japanese in northern china and so you know and you have these these and this this is also part of why the, the records aren't aren't that like well known because you know the survivors, there's a huge cultural thing about like, ever, you know, you, you, like, you know, we, we, we can, we've been talking a lot in the last few years about how hard it is for any rape survivors to just like talk about in the open. And like, this is so much harder and yeah. there's all these political constraints on it. And yeah, and this stuff, you know, like this stuff is not that well known in, in the West and, and it leads to situations like so something that happened a couple of years ago, Stephanie Kelton, who was, who was Bernie's economic advisor and is like probably the most famous like modern monetary theory person, like went to Japan and advised a group of like of liberal Democratic Party lawmakers. And some of those people were like in fascist groups that were like founded by Nanjing denialists. And, you know, th- this stuff happens because there's just the absolute horror that that happened here. Just people don't know about it because it's not like the Pacific isn't the theater that people talk about much other than sort mm-hmm. of Island hopping and like, yeah, that's sort of Japanese prisoners of war. Yeah. Now, now Kishi's role in this while he's in Manchukuo is sort of interesting. So Manchukuo merely, and I'm, I'm using this as enormous scare quotes, merely has 42 sex slave stations, which is, is kind of low for a region that size, although again, Kishi like Kishi just like lets this happen. Kishi's like fine with it. He he's almost certainly is diverting economic resources to it. But the reason it's so low compared to a lot of other places is that Kishi's yakuza buddies are doing like exactly the same shit in their brothels. Like it's it's, it's not it's not quite as bad, but you know they're also kidnapping a bunch of women and like repeatedly raping them. But but you know because 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 the yakuza is like so heavily in control of the sex trade. He, there's less of the sort of straight up military taking control of it. And, you know, and the Yakuza stuff, Kishi, like Kishi's fucking like, like, these are all like all the people doing this are like his personal friends. And like, he's, you know, Kishi's in these brothels constantly while he's in Manchuria. And, you know, so he gets pulled out of Manchuria in 1939 to become the vice minister of commerce in order to plan what's called the new economic order. And, you know, this is, you know, I talked about in, in the first episode, that the, the, the sort of the third phase of, of Japanese imperialism, I call Tokyo imperialism three Tokyo drift. And this really, I think is, is, is where that starts or, I mean, not starts, but like this is the sort of finality of it. You know, like all of the sort of abuse you have like happening in the colonies, like, you know, the, the, this, this, all the stuff that creates fascism in, in Manchukuo, all the stuff that like, you know, all of the sort of fascism in the Japanese army, all of that fascism that's been in this sort of puppet state, 
it, you know, it all comes home. And, you know, and you, you, get, you get Kishi going there in 1937, and that, that fuses these sort of like Tokyo edu- – highly educated fascist like Tokyo bureaucrats with, with this sort of military like fascism. And those guys take control of Japan, and that's how you get – you know, that, that, that's how you get sort of full-scale fascism in Japan. And, you know, in 1940, 1941, when this stuff is being implemented, implemented like the political parties just like dissolve themselves – and, you know, they're like, okay, well, there's, there's no point for parties anymore. We're just going to work with totalitarianism. And you get – inside of Japan, like, you get these – I don't know how to describe them. I guess it's like, you know, the the the, the, the these sort of like mass fascist groups. So the Concordia Association had been that group in Manchuria. And Kishi is sort of invo- involved in help setting up the Imperial Rural Assistance Association, which is, you know, this is like this – this is the New Order's version of this. And, you know, it's it's supposed to be this, like, sort of mass fascist organization to build like, the bureaucracy, and it's about sort of building support for the war. And meanwhile, Kishi is just sort of, like, Kishi's kind of, like, dicking around with his planning models. So, you know, his his big thing in this period is he wants to, he wants to turn, he, he basically, he wants to turn Japan into, into a version of Manchuria, where it's, the, the entire economy, the whole society is built towards just fueling what the army is doing. And he's, so he starts he's creating these things called control associations, which are, you know, it's on an industry level. Everyone in the control association is like forced to work together, like all, all the companies, all the unions. And he, so the, 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 he, he, the head of each control association is called the Führer. Okay, that sounds good. Not a word with any connotation. Yeah. Let's move on. No. Let's just move right on. It's, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and the funny part about this is that I'm like, I'm about 90% sure from the way it's described that like they are literally, so they're, they're speaking Japanese normally. And then when they have to address the guy, they say the word Führer in German. Like they cool. just, they say Führer in Seems German. Fine. Look, it's, it's great. like uh, when we want to, it's like using the word Schadenfreude, you know, some German words are yeah, just better. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and th- this Führer is supposed to, you know, they're supposed to control like the entire production process, right? They're, they're, they're the people who set the prices, they're the people who, they set quantities, they set distribution, they set the organization production process. And these are people, these are the like, the people like Kishi who are the kind of like boring bureaucrats who do all of the war machine stuff. And this like really pisses off the 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 sort of Zebatsu and the, like the big business people because they're like, oh wait, hold on, what do you mean everything is run by the state now? And so they accuse, uh, they accuse Kishi of communism. Okay. And so mm-hmm. Kishi like like ha- like half of his allies like all get arrested because on, on accusations of being communists, and he's like forced to resign. And so you know there, there's there, there's like a, there's like an eight month period. When he's out of power, when you can be like, okay, everything that happened in this eight month period in 1940 was not Kishi's fault. But then, you know, his his old friend Hideki Tojo becomes the prime minister in 1941, and he brings Kishi back as the the minister of commerce and industry, just in time for Kishi to sign the declaration of war with the U.S. Right, like uh, I guess technically speaking, it was it was written before. I guess I guess they did technically hand it to the U.S. before Pearl Harbor. Like right before Kishi sort of goes back to work, like trying to turn Japan into just like a national defense state, and you know he he this time around though he makes he makes two decisions. One is that he's going to work with the corporations because weirdly these corporations are like the only resistance left to him, and the second one is that he's like okay I don't have enough bureaucratic power, so I'm going to just like merge every single Japanese agency like together to form a super agency called the Ministry of Musicians. Munitions, and at this point, Kishi, Kishi is just running the economy. Like he, he is the guy. He's the guy running the entire logistics network for all of the soldiers doing all the horrible things. Japanese Empire. Like he's, he's the guy running the entire economy, making this work. Cool. But you know, and I say this like Kishi, Kishi, I think is very different than like your sort of classical fascist bureaucrat. Like the image of it is someone like like Eichmann. Like Hannah or Rent coins, but like the banality of evil to to do these guys who was like, well, okay, they're kind of just doing their job. And like Kishi, Kishi is not that. Kishi Kishi is running the war machine because he like deeply, deeply, sincerely believes that like this is what's good for Japan. And so you know, but but the other thing, he's also a bureaucrat, so he's also kind of like he spends the the, the war just sort of like. He's like shuffling ministries around. He's like shuffling. He's doing all this sort of bureaucratic stuff. And as the war starts to end, Kishi Kishi looks at the situation as as like the U.S. just like absolutely obliterates the Japanese Navy at Midway, and he goes, "Oh fuck! How can I get out of the war crimes tribunal?" And his plan is that he's going to bring down like Prime Minister Tojo's cabinet 
by resigning and doing this complicated stuff. And like, you know, this works. Like Kishi, Kishi is able to force Toja to resign. And Kishi forms this like sort of nominally, this group like nominally opposed to the government. But, you know, but like, and the, the whole goal of this is basically just like, it's, it's him saying to MacArthur, like, please don't shoot me. <laughs> and it works. Kishi, Kishi's taken prisoner by the occupation government and is inevitably thrown in, in the infamous Sugomo prison in 1946 as a suspected class A war criminal. Now, if the word justice like meant literally anything in this world other than just being a cruel joke to torment survivors, Kishi would have hung from a rope in 1948, and that would have been the end of this two-part episode. Unfortunately, we live in hell, and Kishi is going to be back in part three with friends of the show, the Dulles Brothers, in order to oh. build the entire modern oh, Japanese oh, political system. Oh, hell oh. yeah. There we go. There we <laughs> yep. go. Swish. Yep. Bringing in our favorite sidekick. <laughs> well, not no, favorite. That's, cause that's Jay Stoll. They're not L. Ron Hubbard, but they're pretty great. Um, <laughs> fucking A. That's, that's beautiful. Yeah. Oh, well, Chris, I am excited to hear from our old friends, the Dulles brothers. Um, but we're going to have to wait until Thursday for that because this is, I a, am a not good excited to hear from our old classic friends. Three <laughs> Dulles brothers. You know, it's going to uh, be great. Alan old family Foster, reunion. Two non-problematic guys who were never friends with any Nazis. That's the thing everyone remembers about the Dulles brothers is the, the, uh, the degree to which they were not close friends with Nazis. Uh, so, yeah, follow us at Cool Zone Media, at Bastards Pod on Twitter and Instagram. And allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> and uh, Chris, do you want to give them your Twitter handle? Yeah, um, I'm at ItMeCHR3 on Twitter. Allegedly. Um, allegedly. Allegedly. I'm, I'm alleg- allegedly better known as the Ice Must Be Destroyed guy. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that, that, that's, that that's is your Twitter. legal name. And in happy well, and, in, and in happy news, I just found a whole Reddit thread of people talking about how they appreciate how cute Anderson is. So yay! Oh, mm-hmm. oh yes, no, Anderson's huge on Reddit. You're huge on um, Reddit, Anderson. Good for you. Kid. All right, motherfuckers. Good job. Good job Come Andy. back Thursday. Come back Thursday, and we will we will wrap you in our our warm slightly gropey embrace of podcast. Bye.